We can have a, a brief conversation. I mean, I don't have any, like, strong commitments to realism in general. I also... No, hold on. I also, um... I don't have, like, too terribly long, so... Uh, I am... Before we get into that, I mean, what are just the sort of positions that you take, I guess? Uh, I guess I am most sympathetic to either uh, moral realism or moral error theory. Okay, but I mean, like, metaphysical views outside of ethics. I don't really have many views. I'm somewhat sympathetic to physicalism and if i were not to be a physicalist i would probably be a physicalist about almost everything but the mind and morality okay and what type of moral ethical i mean like a robust ethical realism uh, or let's put it this way if if i were going to be a physicalist about the mind then i would probably be a meta ethical naturalist Okay, uh, but if I were to be a dualist about the mind, then I would probably be a meta-ethical non-naturalist. Okay, I see. Yeah. The two, I see the two issues as kind of parallel. Like many of the arguments against physicalism about the mind are very similar to the arguments against um, non-naturalist moral realism, and vice versa. Yeah. So. I mean, again, you know, that I've been reading quite a bit of new literature lately, so I don't really have any super hard commitments. I generally have a lot of sympathies towards some form of non-reductive projects, um, but that wouldn't just be um, just limited to the mind. I have sort of non-reductive tendencies for things within um, the natural world as well, um, which... Either I would be okay with like some form of non-reductive monism, or either that or some sort of ontological pluralism. But since I see that there's some sort of causal closure principle, and that is that I think that there's a sort of um, univocity of causality that occurs between the mind and chemistry and biology, right? That they're, they're, they both share this sort of causal closure that I would just be sort of inclined to take a sort of monistic position. Now, as for, um, as for like the sort of case between idealism and realism, I just told like what John McDowell holds as a sort of identity theory of truth. That is like when our experiences are veridical, and they're of actual substantive content that sort of mirrors the world. There's really no ontological separation or epistemic uh, distinction between how the world is and how our experiences are, if that kind of breaks down the, the views that I have. Is he still there? Yeah, I was listening. I, I'm not, I mean, that, there, there's a lot there. I, I don't know what I should focus on exactly. Um, but presumably, ask yourself, wanted us to talk about moral realism in particular so well uh, he wanted me to talk about with you about realism but if you have like a moral position i guess yeah don't don't let me dictate the flow of the conversation i mean just whatever stands out to you dude uh well um let's see so there are these causal exclusion worries for certain positions like dualism um I also think there's a causal exclusion worry for, for moral realism, but that's usually ignored. Um, and the worry is something like if, if, there are, if there are zombie worlds, for example, worlds that are exactly the same as the actual world physically, but in which no one is conscious, then it seems like consciousness makes no difference uh, to our behavior. Because even if none of us were conscious, we would still behave exactly the same way. Um, however, it seems like if you hold some kind of metaphysical 
supervenience thesis where you think that zombie worlds are impossible, then you're going to you're going to avoid uh, causal exclusion worries. And since pretty much everybody in metaethics, except like three philosophers, think that um, the moral facts metaphysically supervene on the physical facts, um, it seems like you're not going to have any causal exclusion worry whatsoever for morality. I just real quick, what do you mean by causal exclusion principle? Just right. So the, the, these are arguments, causal exclusion arguments um, are arguments against, uh, for example, dualism. And they usually have as, as a premise that the physical is causally closed. And there are different ways of interpreting that. But one way of interpreting it is that um, for any event that occurs, there is some physical event that occurs that causes uh, the other event. And another premise is something mm -hmm. like uh, our mental states cause our behavior. Mm -hmm. And another premise is that there's no systematic causal overdetermination. And then you're supposed to get the conclusion that um, mental states uh, supervene on physical states, which dualism seems to be incompatible with. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, is that supposed to sort of attack my position or something, or are you just... Well, you, you brought up causal exclusion, but it seems like that's not actually going to be a problem for, like, non-naturalist moral realism. Because oh yeah 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 I don't I don't think the moral facts supervene on the physical facts. Yeah, I I I don't have a problem with that, right? So I mean, I generally I generally hold non-reductive theories of where some sort of supervenience relationship holds. Uh, I haven't really thought about like morality and how that would work with supervenience. Uh, yeah, I mean, another reason I brought it up is you said that you're sympathetic to non-reductive views, but it seems like you can hold a non-reductive view while still avoiding um, these causal exclusion worries because you think that the mind or whatever it is supervenes metaphysically on the physical. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, you can think that um, that my being in pain is not identical to any right. physical state. Yeah, um, but nonetheless, my being in pain um, is causally efficacious, right? Back to my behavior, mm -hmm. and yet there's no overdetermination, and the reason is is that um, my being in pain metaphysically supervenes on uh, some physical state. It would still be a non-reductive view, though, because the, my being in pain would would not be identical to any physical state, right? Yeah, just to sort of explain it to the audience that's listening here, right? So supervenience just is sort of the um, the idea that there's a, I know I'm just going to read out the definition, a sort of relationship between the sets of properties or sets of facts as X is set to supervene on Y, if and only if there's some difference in Y that's necessary for the difference of X being possible. Um, and I generally hold that the mind would supervene on the physical so any sort of change within the mind would probably have a change within the physical world. Uh, I would also, in virtue of that, hold some sort of causal closure principle of where even though the mind is not reducible to the physical world, any sort of non yeah, any sort of change within the mind has a sort of change within the uh, physical world that is still holding on to some sort of non-reductive theory and I think that's possible because of um, top-down relationships, right? So, uh, I, I don't know if I'm just like ignoring what you're saying because I'm trying to like incorporate what you're saying into my view. I didn't see anything sort of incompatible. Well, with what you said how, about, how about I just ask this? Um, well, I, there are a few different things I could ask, but what? Well, all right, let me start here. So, so why do you hold a non-reductive view? as opposed to a reductive view. With the mind? Yeah, let, let, let's focus on the mind specifically. So, so why do you hold a non-reductive view about the mind as opposed to a reductive view? Um, just generally the cases that I think that 
the types of causes that are occurring within the mind with respect to intentional actions and second order beliefs seem to be unique. Um, doesn't seem like generally physical descriptions can tell us much about why we choose to do certain types of things. Um, so, so why couldn't it be that um, your being in pain, for example, is identical to some neural state of your brain, and, and yet um, you couldn't know that simply by reflecting on the meaning of the term pain or the meaning of a term for the neural state, that um, terms like pain and terms like uh, C fiber firing are similar to terms like water and terms like H2O yeah. in that um, with respect to water and H2O, to be water just is to be H2O. But you wouldn't know that simply by reflecting on the meanings of the terms. Why, why couldn't that be the case with respect to pain and brain states? Uh, it depends. So if we have like a type of like classic naturalism, it's because causal states aren't going to be um, um, sufficient enough to explain uh, the normativity of our intentional states and the normativity of our beliefs. That is like, if I want to associate a certain type of causal state with a certain type of intentional state, right, I'm going to have to associate some causal state. Um, however, whether I associate causal state A or causal state B is going to require some sort of um, some sort of um, ought there. That is some sort of way of structuring an identity theory that requires normativity, that requires epistemic um, justification. It doesn't seem like it could just require causal descriptions alone. Does that make sense? Not quite. So it, it seems like you're assuming that like pain is a normative state. No, I think that our beliefs are normative states. I don't know about pain. I think pain might be reducible. Okay. Um, so why, why couldn't it be that um, the concept of a belief, for example, is a normative concept, but it picks out a brain state? There's no, there's no way of doing that, right? Because nothing about the causal state, if it is some sort of classic naturalism, is going to be normative. There's going to be... It would, it would be if, if a normative concept picked it out. What are you... I'm not, I'm not following. Um, if, if, there's, if there's this state, a neural state, that's picked out by a concept in neurophysics, but it's also picked out by some normative concept, then it would be both neuro neurophysiological and normative. Is, is, to is, be the, normative. is the naturalistic state normative itself? Uh, it, it can be when it's picked out by a normative concept. Are you, are you saying that things within the natural world are going to be... I mean, do you, would you buy into some sort of... Sorry, some sort of thesis of where... Like conceptual content works, at, is it within the world, or like there's some sort of like normativity within the world? Well, well, yeah. On a reductive view, there would be normativity in the world. There would be normativity in the brain, for example, because certain brain states would just be beliefs, and beliefs are normative. No, you would have to. You'd have to know the. That's well, the we're holding that there's no that fundamentally there's no normativity because a brain state is going to be something that uh, holds in virtue of like fundamental physical facts, which are non-normative. But the brain state itself might be normative if it's identical to belief. I don't understand how you can have an identity theory in that sense if the, if the causal states are going to be non-normative. Well, they're, they're, they're going to be um, normative because they're picked out by a normative concept, but they're also going to be neurophysiological because they're picked out by a neurophysiological concept. So something Yeah, but you're saying they're reducible to the causal explanations. 
Well, yeah. And, and, it's and one thing to have like a non-reductive theory, but not a reductive theory. Because I don't know how the causal explanations are ever going to do that without evoking normativity. You uh, need like some sort of principled reason for why I ought to associate this with that. Do you mean you would need some principled reason to think that your belief just is a brain state? Yeah. So one reason would be parsimony. It's going to result in a simpler theory. Not if the causal explanations are um, going to underdetermine the, the content of our beliefs. What, uh, what, 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 I'm not quite sure what you mean. So what, what would the causal explanations be? Yeah. What would they look like without evoking some sort of normativity? I don't really, because causation is a, a normative notion. Right. But uh, it seems like intentional states are, right? And it seems like beliefs are as well. So I just don't know how you're going to get from a causal explanation to an, in, <clears throat> to an intentional one or, you know, like certain types of things like um, normative beliefs or whatever, right? Because I could have like multiple causal states that are... Um, I could have like multiple examples that are consistent with my intentional action. Doesn't seem like any of them are going to sort of over determine which types of intentional actions I'm going to make. Same thing with the belief, I think. So, right, I mean, like these are the sort of arguments that you hear, I think, on Discord pretty often is like, let's say that I was going to go to the park and then I intended to go to the park, right? I have a sort of intentional. Uh, a sort of belief that I'm going to go there and a sort of intentional action that I'm going to commit certain types of actions. I could like seek out certain types of like behavioral patterns to describe while I'm what I'm doing basically in that park. But those behavioral patterns are going to be consistent with multiple forms of um, intentions, right? Uh, they're going to be, they're never going to describe the intention that's going to occur there. At uh, least if the causal explanations are non-normative. Yeah. Now, if they're truly like logical, I would be okay with that. I, I agree that you could, you could have the disposition to behave in some way without having a belief that is typically associated with that disposition. But what's much less clear is whether you could be in a certain neural state um, without having a certain kind of belief. And neural states aren't aren't simply dispositional states. I'm I'm kind of curious, and what I'm I guess I'm just not understanding what you mean about neural states just being non merely dispositional. Well, they're, they're I mean, if they are if they are not merely dispositional and they have some sort of normativity associated with them, I'm okay with that form of um, reductivism, like. Yeah, I guess I just have to. I'd have to know what you're. Yeah, what you're talking about. Well, the point is, is that you can be disposed, behave in a certain way under certain conditions, mm -hmm. even if you don't have the kind of neural state that would be required to have a certain mental state. Um. So, and and that's that's simply because you can learn to condition your behavior in certain ways. So you, you could get into a neural state that typically gives rise to pain and yet learn to uh, prevent yourself from ever exhibiting avoidance behavior. Um, so like, for example, when somebody picks you with a pin, uh, with a pin you, you, you don't flinch, you don't shriek, you don't scream, you don't do any of that stuff. And as many times as somebody picks you with a pin, a, a pin, a pin you never do that, but you're still in the very same neural state that everybody else is in when they experience pain. Um, so that wouldn't necessarily show that that your pain isn't one and the same as a certain neural state. And the same point could be made about a belief. Um, you could have a certain disposition, yeah. behave in a certain way, um, without that indicating that you're not in a certain neural state that is typically associated with a certain kind of belief. So 
But what is the norm? I mean, would, would, I still don't quite follow, though. I, I understand that. I just don't quite follow what you were saying earlier about neural states as not being merely dispositional. What do you, what do you have in mind there? Uh, well, it's going to depend on what you take a disposition to be. But dispositions usually involve being such that you would behave in a certain way under certain circumstances. Um, and dispositions can be realized um, regardless of like the physical makeup of, of what realizes it. Whereas neural states are sensitive to like the um, chemical makeup of, of something. So you, you couldn't have a neural state in something made out of silicon, for example. Whereas you could have exactly the same disposition as you have in a biological organism in something that's made out of silicon. So being a neuron or, or being in a certain neural state is sensitive to like the chemical makeup, makeup of something, but not simply what it would do under certain circumstances. I'm still trying to think, I mean, I haven't heard this quite, okay. So you're saying that certain types of neural states are what? They're, they're sensitive to chemical makeup? And what is this supposed to imply? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last portion? The notion of a neural state is partly biological. It depends mm -hmm. on um, like the chemicals from which you're composed. Whereas a disposition is totally independent of your bio biology or the chemicals um, from which you're composed. So you could have two things that are radically different in terms of their biology that have the same dispositions, whereas you couldn't have two things that are radically different in terms of their biologies, but are in the same neural states. I'm not getting, I'm still not getting why the neural states aren't, can't be cashed out in terms of dispositions. So do you, by dispositions, do you mean certain types of like um, causal tendencies? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, and do you, do you think anything within um, the brain displays causal tendencies? Or are you just saying certain types of things within the brain don't exhibit causal tendencies? Uh not quite sure what to think about that. I, I was just pointing out that a mere disposition is insensitive to the level of description um, that you're describing something at. So you could have two things that are chemically very different that have the same dispositions. Um, yeah. yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think, yeah, you can have yeah, you can have like, um, obviously there's like multiple sorts of animals, right? With different types of like biological parts that all go through similar type of biological functions like metabolism and homeostasis. So like, yeah, I think that similar, similar uh, structures can yield different types of functional results, if that's what you're saying. Um, but I'm not really sure what that has to do with yeah, neural tendencies. I, I guess I'm confused, but it might just be because it's really late and I'm just really confused. So. <laughs> um, let me, yeah, um, let me, I'm trying to think about how, what would be the most productive direction to take the conversation. So you, you were trying to say something like um, mental states, like, like belief states, couldn't be the same as neural states because you're never going to get normativity out of something that's merely causal. Was that a way of putting it? Yeah, that's one of the things. Um, I'm trying to find a, a, maybe another route to take this with. Um, although I guess I've never worded this other kind of objection that I would generally have. Do you, do you think that, um, I mean, do, do you think that, uh, do I think what? 
No, I'm sorry. I'm still trying to think of how I put. I, I should put this all because you're acting. Uh, you're asking sort of, I guess, maybe tangential uh, questions to what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. Anyways, I, I'll have to think about this. But um, what the argument is supposed to be? I mean, like, here's an argument some people will will give. They'll say, um, it, if if it were the case that a brain state is identical to a neural state, then it would be metaphysically impossible to have the brain state without uh, sorry, to have the neural state without the mental state. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, however, sure. it's conceivable that you can have the neural state without, yeah. without yeah. the mental state. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm familiar with that conceivability, argument. Yada, yada, yada. I'm trying to figure out if like, that's the kind of argument you're giving or if it's different. Uh, nah, not really. That's just a conceivability argument by Chalmers. I mean, do you have like a reply to that, by the way? I'm kind of, I'm curious if there is a sort of reply to a sort of conceivability argument that we can picture, um, we can picture a body having all the same functional parts, uh, as a body with a mind, except without a mind in the original. And um, we can add one more thing that we didn't conceive of there, namely the mind. So therefore, we have at least one property that wasn't, you know, reducible to the physical descriptions. That's what you're kind of getting at right here. I mean, that's not, I mean, I've, I've had that argument before, but I don't know if that's the argument that I'm pulling out right now. Uh, but I am curious if you have so like... That's not the kind of argument that I'm not really sure what the argument is. Um, so that, that's what I was trying to get to, to the bottom of. It's just the idea that intentional states um, could be consistent with various types of empirical descriptions. There's just no empirical description that you can give that's going to give a... What do you mean? It, it, in other words, you might not be able to work out simply by reflecting on the concept of a certain mental state that it's one and the same as a certain neural state um but many physicalists would just agree to that because they're going to say that mental concepts are indefinable um whereas physical concepts often are definable um, but that's no bar to those concepts picking out the very same thing just like um you know, the, the concept water isn't definable in such a way that you can work out that water is H2O. You have to do empirical investigation to discover that. Sure. So I'm just trying to get clear on what the objection is supposed to be. Um, because, because, I mean, there's a sort of sim simplistic way of understanding the objection where it doesn't sound like a very good objection, which is just that, uh, belief states don't seem to be, uh, neural states. Um, and if something doesn't seem to be a neural state, then it probably isn't. Therefore, it probably isn't. But that doesn't seem like a very... Oh, no, that's not what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. That's so what exactly is the argument then? Yeah, one can have like a sort of intentional belief that they're going to go to the park, right? And this can be consistent with many different types of empirical descriptions. You can say that's going to be this empirical description, but how do you know that that empirical description doesn't match a very similar intentional state? That, uh, yeah, a very similar intentional state to the one that it could have been. Um, so... Let's say that I was intending to, yeah, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, other than the park example that I gave, how are, how are you going to match any sort of identity with intentional states about that? I'll, I'll just ask that question. Um, so there's like an epistemological question, which is how we could know whether a given belief state is identical to a given uh, neural state. But what some physicalists are going to say is that you couldn't know it. But that doesn't mean that it's false. And they might say you couldn't know it because there's something special about mental concepts that will bar you 
from ever being able to, to dissolve an explanatory gap. Um, other physicalists might say that you might be able to know it by, for example, um, looking at the kinds of behavior that people exhibit or the, or the kinds of functions that people exhibit when they're in a certain neural state and then inferring to the best explanation as to what that mental state is. But it sounds like you're not simply making an epistemological point about whether we can know that the thesis is correct, but that you're making a claim that the thesis is false. So that, that's what I'm having a hard time understanding. Yeah. Okay, so how about this? How about I just offer a, a syllogism then? And this one's just from uh, Ross. It's just that all formal thinking is determinate. No physical process is determinate. No formal thinking is a physical process. Is that is that sufficient for you? And the idea there is like that our thoughts have to be determinate, determinate or semantically determinate in some sort of sense. Because if they weren't, then we couldn't make the um, argument that um, uh, that our semantical content is indeterminate because as soon as we do that, right, it's going to lead to a reductio. And I don't see a way of basically saying that physical processes are determinate without getting into teleological explanations. So I'll just, I'll give you this argument here. I don't, I'm not quite sure I get it. Like, doesn't a, a gas gauge like determinately represent the speed of a car? I'm trying to remember how this argument went. It's been a long time. So the idea that, um, God, yeah, it's been a long time since I've done this. Uh, semantically determinal, formal thinking, no processes. You know, I'll have to, might, I might have to come back to you because it's been a while since I've looked at this John Ross uh, argument. And I can't think of it right off the top of my head right now about why the indeterminacy of it is. Who's John Ross, Ross by the way? Uh, he's, he's this guy, um, that had, it had made this, this argument earlier, or sorry, James Ross, the immaterial aspect of thought. Hold on, maybe if I read it, I can remember it. But it's going to take a while. And you, you pasted this somewhere in general? No, I gave it to you via PM. Oh, okay, let me look. And James Ross, is, is he a philosopher or who is he? Yeah. Oh, okay, let me look. Well, I've got a second. Is there a book by him that you uh, would suggest I read? I think it, okay, so if I remember correctly, it's something like, um, imagine that I'm trying to get a, an empirical process down determinately. Um, however, if I'm trying to get an empirical process down determinately, a skeptic could always come up and say, well, that, um, that um, description that you basically gave of the physical world could have been consistent with that determinate property or sorry that determinate description or it could have been consistent with one like it but slightly different right and so you're going to have to basically determine um whether or not it's consistent with one or the other but because there's always this sort of skeptical hypothesis you can't necessarily do that but you can do that with one's own thoughts because they are of a certain type of determinate or semantically determinate content does that make sense? Quite sure. It maybe sounds similar to an argument that I do understand. Um, I could try to describe it, but I'm not. It might be totally unrelated to what you you just said. Um, so there's like a problem for explaining how it is that uh, concepts, like the concept of a particular belief 
or the concept of an experience, like the experience of pain, how it is that they determinately refer um, to one particular physical physical state as opposed to another, given that those physical states are extremely complicated. Um, and you need to be able to tell a story that is physicalistically friendly. Um, so in other words, you, you can't appeal to like irreducible acquaintance or something like that. You need, you need to tell like some physical story about how these mental concepts pick out whatever it is, whatever it is that they pick out. Yeah, but how do you, how do you, how would you in principle do that if there's always a sort of skeptical argument showing you that that could have been completely consistent with a sort of proposition that you give, but slightly different? So, so one thing people will say is that phenom is that mental concepts actually don't determinately refer to anything; they indeterminately refer. To so yeah, they, but if you do, if you say that then at least formal thinking is determinate, right? And nothing about no, our decisions about the physical is going to be determinate. What, what is formal thinking? Um, I think they mean something like being able to use like maybe monus ponens or monus tollens or, you know, being able to, you know, some in some sort of way talk about like mental faculties and the use of inferences and presumably the use of inferences is sort of determinate. Um, because determinacy is usually, I, I thought the way this person was using the term determinate is as a property of a representation. So, um, uh -huh. an example of like something that indeterminately refers would be, what would trying to think of an example of this um i don't know if they do refer to representations it's been so long since i've read this article but yeah go ahead sorry yeah i'm i'm having a hard time thinking of a good good example of this um so like for example if i if i introduce the term um the border between New York State and New Jersey. That seems like it's going to be the kind of thing that doesn't determinately refer to anything. So there's not going to be like a specific region that that term picks out. Rather, there are going to be a span of regions, each of which is like an equally good candidate for being the border between New York and New Jersey, but there's going to be no fact of the matter as to which of those is the one that I was talking about when I was when I introduced the term um, uh, the border between uh, New York and New Jersey. By contrast, if I introduce a term for like um, the state of a fundamental physical particle, like whether it has spin up or spin down. Um, that's the kind of thing that's going to be be determinate in that there's a particular state I'm referring to, and there's a fact of the matter as to which state exactly it is that I'm referring to. Uh, that's how I was understanding determinacy versus indeterminacy. So what some philosophers say is is that concepts like the concept of you're believing that it's raining outside, are indeterminate in that there are a bunch of neural states that would be equally equally good candidates for being your belief that it's raining outside but right. there's no fact of the matter as to which of them it refers right. to. that is or the argument another yeah. example um uh, there are a range of differences in various creatures um states that we could describe and if you start at the one end, end of the spectrum, you might have something that's fully conscious. And if you get to the, under, the other end of the spectrum, you might have something that's totally unconscious. But somewhere in the middle, there are going to be a range of states that are like equally good contenders for being a state that is 
conscious versus being a state that is unconscious. And what some people will say is, is that the concept of consciousness is such that it doesn't determinately refer to any one of those states. Like there's no fact of the matter as to which of those states would be a totally conscious one and which of them would be a totally unconscious state. Right. So we would need an argument for thinking that um, mental concepts, like the concept of a belief, are determinate. That, that there is always a fact of the matter as to what they refer to. Um, yeah, okay. I think I follow. So do, are you saying that I need to provide that argument? Uh, well, well, you're, you're the one who I, who is, as far as I know, claiming that like not a non-reductive view is superior to a reductive view. And if part of, part of, part of the case for that claim is supposed to be that, um, it's supposed to involve something having to do with uh, determinacy. I, I'm basically just trying to get clear on what, what the argument is. Right. Well, I thought I followed you, and I thought you were representing the argument, but I guess I didn't follow you earlier. And this argument that I gave has been a while since I've read it, but we can talk about it maybe tomorrow if you want, and then I'll refresh it upon it. But this is the same, I think, argument that, I mean, at least a very similar argument to something that Venus would actually give or like Jack would actually give. So, but See, it's I, also, I think, I think I understand what Jack's argument is. Like Jack would say, um, that there, there's no such thing as a synthetic identity. Um, so if a is identical to B, then that's going to be because the uh, term a and the term B mean the same thing or they're otherwise definable in terms of each other um but if a physicalist view were to have any plausibility it would have to be committed to a synthetic identity where like your belief is identical to a brain state um but uh that has nothing to do with with what the term for the belief state means and what the term for the mental state means, or sorry, for the brain state means. Um, actually, let me start over. Let me put that more clearly. So t take a particular belief, like your belief that it's raining outside, and then take a particular neural state, neural state N. Um, your belief that it's raining outside is identical to neural state N uh, only if either it's analytically identical to it or it's synthetically identical to it but it's not analytically identical to it because there's no contradiction in supposing that you're in neural state n but you don't have the belief that it's raining outside so if it's identical to it at all it must be synthetically identical to it but there's no such thing as a synthetic identity so it can't be identical to it at all so it's just not identical to that brain state. I think I think that's basically what Jack would say, but I'm not quite sure. I didn't, I, I've never heard him say synthetic identity like that. He might not put it quite in those terms, but I think that's basically his view. So like, he, he, for example, he would deny that, that, that water and H2O are one and the same. Because he thinks that the, the term water just doesn't mean the same thing as the term H2O. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that's something that uh, I haven't heard it quite put in a synthetic. I mean, do you have any sort of arguments for um, why you couldn't? Sorry, why you could have synthetic identities then? Um, I don't see any reason to, to deny it. You can have concepts that pick out the same thing but you can fail to realize that they pick out the same thing because, because there's no information associated with the two concepts that would that would enable you to figure it out so like you could know that um samuel clemens you know wrote such and such novels 
Mm -hmm. didn't know that Mark Twain wrote such and such novels and not realize that Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens are the same individual. And yet, nonetheless, they are. Um, so that that would be a case of a synthetic identity, it seems. Oh, like the, is this also the same thing as like the Clark Kent and Superman? Yeah, it's another right. example. Um, yeah. it, it looks like Clark, Clark Kent could be one and the same as Superman. Um, even though if, if you knew everything about the concept of Clark Kent and you knew everything about the concept of Superman. Um, yeah, I've heard, I've heard that reply to, I've heard, again, it's been too long because I've heard that reply to this argument too. And then I heard a counter reply to that argument that you just gave, but I don't remember it anymore since, you know. Yeah, so the, the thought is like, how would you go about figuring out or coming to know that Superman is Clark Kent. Well, here's how you would do it. You would follow Superman around. Mm -hmm. You would follow Clark Kent around. And then if you did that for long enough, you would soon discover that um, in every location that you find Superman, you also find Clark Kent and vice versa. Now, that doesn't logically entail that Superman and Clark Kent are identical because for all you know, there are two distinct individuals that are always spatiotemporally coincident. However, it seems like the simpler and more parsimonious hypothesis would be that they're one and the same. There's just one individual that you've been following around. And the thought is, is that you could have the same kind of argument for a belief state being the same as a neural state. You could observe that anytime someone has the belief that um, snow is white, that they're in a certain kind of neural state, and that even though that, that doesn't logically entail that um, the neural state and the belief state are one and the same, that the simpler explanation is that they're identical. So you, you could get out of that by trying to say that, um, well, you're never going to have, th there are going to be cases in which you don't have the same neural state always associated with the same belief state, because there can be cases in which, um, for example, someone suffers from like extreme brain damage and, you know, the, the left hemisphere of their brain that is ordinarily responsible where many of their beliefs is like taken over by the right hemisphere of their brain. Um, so that's a way out of it. But, but then the question is going to be like, is there a way of describing brain states at a high enough level of abstraction where even in the case where like the entire left hemisphere of someone's brain is destroyed, um, they still count as being in the same brain state when the right side of their hemisphere like takes over whatever function the left left side of the hem the, the left side of, of their brain previously uh, carried out. What if um, just out of curiosity, because we're already getting uh, we're getting into a few things that I've really never thought about. Out of curiosity, but what if you were able to replicate? Um, certain types of uh, mental states, except using certain types of things that aren't brain states, right? You'd have multiple types of physical states basically describe the same, um, same, uh, same types of mental states. Uh, yeah, is that is, an identity theory of some sort? Yeah, this is a worry about this kind of view, which is, but here, here's a way of putting the point that I, I think that you were getting at. Um, so how is it that we have evidence to believe that other individuals other than ourselves are conscious? So like I know um, from first person experience that I feel pain, uh, sorry. I know from first personal experience that I feel pain, I have beliefs, I have desires and so on. But how mm -hmm. do I know that you feel pain, have beliefs and have desires and so on? And the thought is, well, I just observe your behavior. Um, so in the case of pain, I observe that if I stick you with 
pins, you scream and try to avoid the stimulus. Um, or in the case of like the belief that it's raining outside, I observe that when it's raining outside, you're likely to carry an umbrella and so on and so on. So behavior seems to be evidence of certain mental states. Well, then the thought is, well, just look at, for example, an octopus or maybe an artificial intelligence. Um, you, you can find something like that that's going to exhibit the same kind of behavior that, in your case, gives me evidence to believe that you have the exact same mental states that I have. So in those cases, I would also have evidence to believe that the octopus has a certain mental state or that the artificial intelligence has a certain mental state. But if the mind-brain identity theory is true, since the octopus doesn't have the right kinds of neurons, maybe it doesn't have any neurons at all. And the artificial intelligence definitely doesn't have any neurons at all. Right. Maybe it's made out of silicon. It seems like you would have to say, well, those things wouldn't have any mental states at all, or at least wouldn't have the mental states mm -hmm. that I take you to have. But doesn't that mean that I'm then committed to thinking that what is ordinarily evidence or positing a mental state isn't? And that's going to be a problem for the view. Um, there are responses to it, but yeah, I, I agree that that is a problem. Okay. Okay. But um, I, I know you have to go soon, but I'm kind of curious to hear about your views on morality. Um, so that's a slightly different topic. Okay. I mean, what I mean, would, I don't know how much more time I have. I kind of wanted to go to sleep since it's one sixteen a.m. But uh, I mean, what, what did you want to talk about? Well, I, I mean, what what is your view on on that topic? Because ask yourself, mention something like, I actually can't remember how he brought it up. But the implication was that you held some view that, that Ask Yourself, or, or Isaac, uh, wasn't sympathetic to. I'm not quite sure what the view is. Well, I'll, I mean, just because you're talking about me, I'll pipe up. It's, it's not necessarily that I'm not sympathetic, it's just that I don't understand it. And my, my honest motivation is just, I just want to see if it makes sense. And I know if it doesn't make sense, you're going to point out that it doesn't make sense. So that was, that was the motivation. <laughs> I, I also know, although it's of course Marty's choice because he set the rule that Venus would be able to state what the kind of objection is that he would want to raise with this type of view. So I don't know if you want him to come in just to state what the objection is, but that's also an option. Uh, well, oh, Venus is in here, isn't he? Yeah, but that's um, Marty's choice because his his in condition for engagement was no Venus. Well, why doesn't Marty just tell me what the view is first? Just, um, I hold some sort of, or at least I'm inclined to hold some sort of robust moral realism. Um, I generally don't view, well, I mean, yeah, I, I generally don't view sort of causal explanations as being sufficient for, yeah, yeah. So I guess, yeah. So I would say that some sort of moral, robust moral realist view Generally, the idea that um, moral judgments are propositional, um, they're truth apt, they're truth seeking. Um, yeah, basically that. I, I mean, I think I understand what the view is. Um, there are potential problems with it, or maybe the better way to put it is potential reasons to hold a different mm -hmm. view. But I think I, I mean, I understand the view. So I don't know um, how to go from here. Uh, so so let, let me ask you this. So here's one 
argument people will give against a view like that. They'll say, well, look, if, if such a view were true, um, then there would have to be some sort of irreducible normative relation. Um, the relation of one thing's counting in favor of another thing. So, for example, when you say some, when you say that something is morally wrong, you're committing yourself to saying that um, there's some consideration or other that, at least to some extent, uh, counts in favor of not doing something. And the thought is, is that this this idea of one thing is counting in favor of not doing something won't be reducible to anything in the physical sciences. Uh, it also won't be reducible to anything uh, that's purely mental. So it's not going to be like reducible to some sort of dispositional state or some sort of mental state or some sort of experiential state. It's going to be, in that sense, sui generis. Um, but that looks really weird, that we would be committed to something totally unlike everything else to which we're already committed. Um, so if we're going to be committed to something like that, it better have some special explanatory role. But then it looks like when we start asking questions like, what would need to be explained? Well, our beliefs about, you know, which things are wrong which things count in favor of which, those beliefs would need to be explained. Our behavior would need to be explained. So like, how is it that we behave when we have those beliefs and so on and so on. Right. And it looks like we can give a complete explanation all of, the, of all of that in, for example, evolutionary or sociological terms. So isn't the better view, the view that's more likely to be true, just one according to which there's no such thing as this uh, counting in favor of relation. And correspondingly, there's no such thing as like rightness and wrongness. So to sort of summarize, premise one would be that if, if there were moral properties like right and wrong and so on, then there would be this relation of one thing's counting in favor of something else. Um, but if there were such a relation, of one thing's counting in favor of something else, then it would be unusual and bizarre in various ways. Um, and then the third premise would be that if we have two theories, both of which can explain all of the same phenomena, but one of them is committing, committed to something that is bizarre and strange in various ways, and the other isn't, then the one that isn't committed to, committed to that thing is more likely to be true. And then premise four would be um, that naturalistic hypotheses, according to which there's no counting in favor of relation, um, are able to explain everything that needs to be explained without positing such a relation, whereas like, the robust realist view uh, uh, maybe can give the same explanations but posits this additional thing. And then the conclusion... The thing, just, just if you can clarify, you mean just like something that can motivate in and of itself? Like a moral real, um, some sort of moral reason that could motivate a person that's not tied towards their disposition and that's categorical in nature. Well, I didn't say anything about motivation. Okay. It, it's not strange because it's motivational. It's strange because yeah, it's okay. It, yeah. it can't be reduced to anything else which we're already committed to. So, like, suppose you're like a dualist, you're a substance dualist, mm -hmm. and you. The mind is irreducible to the physical. Um, still, you're going to have a relation is irreducible to the mind. So, if you're a dualist, you're committed to two things: you're committed to the physical and you're committed to the mental. But now you're committed to this third, completely distinct thing: normativity. Um, and similarly, if you're a physicalist and you think that the mind just is the physical, so fundamentally, there's just this one kind of thing. Well, the counting in favor of relation can't be reduced to the physical, so now you're committed to two things. So no matter what your view is on anything else, you're going to be committed to this further thing that is fundamentally unlike anything else to which you're antecedently committed to.
I'm not sure if I completely tracked all that. Um, so, are you also in? <laughs> so, I, I, I guess, I guess to ask you this question, I don't know how much longer I can continue. But um, do you? Do, Zach is horrible at explaining. His point is just that why have coherent entities? Second, one second. I, we all love you, Venus, but it's it's up to we. I did tell Marty that his coming in here would involve you being muted, unless he wants otherwise. Do you want it? I, I, I do, I will say that I see Zach agree with Venus. I understand Venus, that there's, so. like, I understand that he's appealing to queerness, right? So, I, I understand so, that you're so, offering some sort of, like, sorry, error. Mar Mar Marty, I just wanted to say for a second, I, I just, I see, I see Venus summing it up, and Zach agreeing, and it being a lot quicker. Do you want to hear from Venus, or do you want him to remain muted? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, that's fine. Oh, wait, okay. I just want if to it, if at some point, oh, sorry, just one thing, Zach. If at some point you don't want to hear from him, you can of course honor that. You just say so, and I will I'll mute Venus for you. I, I just want to say to Venus that that I pretty much agree with him that I'm like taking way too long to explain this. But in yeah, my I mean, you have like, I mean, you seem to have very idiosyncratic views and obviously like nuanced views, and it's very hard for me to follow them like over voice, especially this late. If you could like write them down or something, and I can t take a look at them, and then I could reply. But I don't mind, you know, I don't mind hearing Venus real quick. But I, the way that I'm understanding what you're saying so far is you're holding on to some sort of error theory, right? <clears throat> and you're and you're holding on to the error theory because you're postulating some sort of uh, queerness objection against moral judgments. Uh, because moral judgments have some sort of uh, quality to them that other types of um, uh, judgments don't, like epistemic judgments in general, right, that are just describing or merely describing the world. Um, but I'm still not quite sure because, you know, you kind of talk in, in long doses and it's sort of hard to lose track of the first thing that you said by the time you go to the fourth or fifth thing, especially when it comes to philosophy. What all of those sort of uh, properties are that you mentioned that are queer? Is it is the categoricity of um, moral judgments like queer or moral properties? However you want to put it, I'm not quite sure because I I also think that like hypothetical imperatives would also be queer. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, they they would also involve like like when you say, for example, that um, if you desire to get to the train station quickly, then you ought to take the bus rather than to walk. Mm -hmm. It still seems like that would involve this irreducible counting in favor of relation, and that is still unlike everything else to which we're antecedently committed to. So if we can explain everything that needs to to be explained without invoking such a relation, then we should dispense with such a relation. Okay, so you do have a very, yeah, so you do seem to have a very, very reductive, or maybe an eliminativist, probably not an eliminativist view. Like, so you just seem to hold, like, some sort of, like, naturalistic thesis of where everything can reduce to causal explanations, but I don't see how... Well, no, I don't think so, because I could be a dualist, for example, and think that the mind is irreducible... Um, yeah, but you can't do that, and then also, well, I guess you could if you appealed to something like qualia, but generally when people appeal to the mind, they're okay with, like, hypothetical imperatives. And hypothetical imperatives or instrumental norms of some sort don't seem too spooky to me. They're just basically ways of, you know, sort of practically engaging with the world. If you have a sort of means and you have an end, sorry, if you have an end, right, then you're just going to find certain types of means in order to generate that end. Um, I don't think that instrumental norms are sufficient, though, because I think they're just a formal principle instead of a substantive principle to use uh, Coast Guard's um, objection to, uh, to people who only use hypothetical norms. The, the the way you just described a hypothetical imperative seemed to me to be non-normative. So, like, I'm okay with the idea that um, certain goals are likely 
um, to further your ends. That's just kind of like a statistical notion. But but the claim that you ought to do something, um, given that it, that it's a means to your end, isn't simply a, a statistical claim. It's a normative claim. And that's what I think would have to go uh, if you bought into the kind of argument that I'm describing. Yeah, in order to do certain types of hypothetical norms, you would have to subscribe to a reason why you're doing X over Y, right? That is, why, why am I committed to some sort of substantive thesis X over Y? Um, because hypothetical norms are only formal. They're only going to tell you what you ought to do if you have already a certain type of goal in mind. But, but presumably we have certain types of goals in mind for certain types of reasons, and we can say that those reasons are either categorical in nature or they're merely dispositional, right? Um, so yeah, I mean... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how far we want to get into the hypothetical imperative stuff because that's kind of a deep issue but but basically I, I i think that if it's true that um if you have a certain goal well, then you ought to do something then a certain relation is going to hold between you and an action the ought to relation and that relation seems mysterious and it doesn't seem like it should matter whatsoever that the holding of that relation depends on some psychological fact about you. Uh, like why should that matter to whether or not you should think that there is such a relation? It, well, because look, you could hold the view that um, the, the only circumstances in which it's the case that I ought to do something is when certain psychological facts hold with respect to me. You could also think that there are situations in which I ought to do something even when those psychological facts don't hold with respect to me. But in either case, it's the same exact fact. It's a fact about what I ought to do. And it doesn't seem like it should matter um, as to that in virtue of which that fact holds um, as to whether or not that fact is problematic to posit. It's going to be the same kind of fact in either case. It's just going to have a different explanation on the one view than it does in the on the other view. Okay. Well, we'll have to continue this another day, then, my good my good sir, because I'm not <laughs> not really sure what that was supposed to mean um, or how that related to what I said. But it could just be me. Like I I just it could be me well, as well. Uh, no, no. I mean, you you seem like very careful on how you articulate yourself. As a matter of fact, I mean, it's it's kind of confusing me so much that I don't even know how to how to reply to you sometimes. So, uh, if I would, if it was like another time of the night, I would give you that Socratic quote of where you know you're like uh, you're like Socrates and basically able to torpedo down a person and not know what they say. You know what I'm referring to, right? You read uh, the good old dialogue, Socratic dialogue. I think it was in uh, Menno, but I could be I could be mis uh, misremembering. But yeah, we can continue this conversation uh, another day or whatever. Because uh, I'm curious, it was what kind of positions you have. I haven't heard these particularly like super reductive positions, uh, and I don't seem to be understanding or tracking you very well. So my apologies. Yeah, no, no worries. We can talk about it later. Um, but if Venus is still here. I'd I'd be curious to see if he um, understood what I said toward the end. Yeah, we, yeah, you can talk. I don't, I don't care. Sure. Sorry, which part? I kind of fell out after you ran the queerness argument. Damn it. Well, all right. Well, I I probably would have to re say it all then. Uh, basically, it, it, some someone asked if. The, the problem I have with um, normativity is that it's categorical in some sense. And I said, no, I don't really think that's a problem because I think that even hypothetical imperatives would be, and that's because they would involve the same counting in favor. But you find the counting in favor relationship to be queer. 
Oh, that's sorry. That's the that's a, that's the issue that you take with, and that's going to be true for for both types, right? Yeah. So, like for example, if you if you say um, if if um, a certain thing is a means to, then have a reason uh, to pursue that means. Well, that's still going to involve this relation of of one thing's counting in favor of another, and it doesn't seem to matter that it depends on a relationship between your means and your ends. Uh, if that relation is queer, then it's queer regardless of whether it depends on your, on your means and ends. Yeah, I mean, you're just running Olson at this point, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, so the, so the thing is, we, it, we don't reject things in virtue of them being queer, right? We reject them if we could get by without positing such queer things. Yeah, um, but it seems like if you get rid of this, um, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like? What's you? Wouldn't you be throwing out all kinds of normativity? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you'd be throwing out probably epistemic justification, and uh, I don't know how you can do that. It just seems like. If you do that, there are going to be things that you cannot explain. Um, and like, if you just throw out like moral stuff, like with more, you know, if you just lecture out more realism or something, that you can get fine by explaining everything else in terms of like evolution or other suggestions given. But when it comes to normativity as a whole, uh, I'm not sure if you can do the same. Plus, uh, I'm not even sure if. Because you'd admit that if you hold that, if you if you hold to um, error theory about normativity, you cannot believe in error theory of, about normativity, right? Yeah, I'm sympathetic to that view. I'm not, uh, but I also don't think that people should really believe most political positions. So, but I don't. I don't. So, if you can't hold. Uh, this if it's true, problem. if it's true, then you cannot believe it. That's the idea, because yeah. belief is normative. I mean, but Schumer just thinks that that's true, and that that actually favors the view, or it makes it more likely to be true. I'm not quite familiar with his argument for that, but uh, but uh, you do you believe? Do you believe you can get by by just dropping normativity as a whole? That there wouldn't be anything. That requires an explanation without the normativity. I don't. So, like for example, I think we could explain. I don't see anything that we couldn't explain uh, why people have a tendency to believe that their beliefs are justified, um, because presumably it's going to contribute more to fitness for you to believe some of your beliefs are justified. And other of your beliefs are unjustified, then then it would be to like not even have the concept of justification, or to think that none of your beliefs are justified. So it seems like we can give some sort of evolutionary explanation for but why we tend to. Think isn't the are. isn't the argument that you're kind of combating right here the idea that how could any of our beliefs not face the consequence of epistemic? Um, perpetual epistemic skepticism, what would justify our, say, sense perceptions or, or you know, our sense organs is actually tracking the world aptly or us being able to make any sort of justification aptly in any sort of way if we offer an <clears throat> evolutionary explanation? Well, on the view I'm, I'm imagining, none of our beliefs are justified, so we don't there know. Will be no, there will be no justification. There's no normativity to begin with. Yeah, yeah so but I don't understand how you. I don't understand how one begins philosophy, or is able to prove whether any form of naturalism of the way that you're kind of seeking out is is yeah is going to be true <laughs> or a justified true belief. If you're just getting away with justification, well, you can provide evidence that makes it likely that a certain view is true. It's just that if you were to come to believe that the view is true it would not be the case that that your belief is justified you would still have probability and first order logic and all of that because none of that is like normative you just wouldn't have justification is that so Zach? 
Sorry, you said, is that so? Is that yes, it, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I, I, like, yeah. You, can, you can have the idea of, um, you can say that, that, that um, there are arguments, um, for example, for error theory that make error theory likely to be true. And, and in that sense, the arguments are good and maybe better than the alternative arguments. But if you were to come to believe error theory, the view would just say of your belief that it's not the case that your belief is justified. And good there wouldn't be normative, obviously. Uh, wait, when did I use the term good? No, you just said that that, that belief would be good. Uh, I'm kind of intoxicated. I, I meant to say that, that the view would say of the belief that it's not the case that the belief is justified. But I, I didn't mean to say that the belief was good or bad. No, okay, now you did use the word good, so I just assumed you like redefined it or something like that. You don't mean good the way it's usually used, because there would be no normativity. It's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting view, but like, it just seems conceivable, because if that view is true, you can't believe anything, right? Um, but it seems conceivable. Wait, because wait, 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 wait. Uh, sorry. What do you What do you mean you can't believe anything? You You can't. Um. You You can't believe the view, oh. but 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 you can think the view is. Well, it's tricky. Um, no, but if the view, so if all beliefs are normative, and there is no such thing as normativity, then you can't believe anything. Uh, well, the question will be whether or not beliefs are normative in the sense that it's claimed they're, it's not, they're a different sense of normativity. Like we talk about chess being normative in the sense that there are like correct and incorrect moves that you can make. Um, but that's not like the sense of normativity that these error theorists are denying the existence of. So the question would be, when you say that beliefs are normative, are, are you saying that um, there are certain considerations that count in favor of having the belief? Or are you just saying that like beliefs can be true or false? Okay, I, I see. Because the consideration part is is the one that the the error theorist is is tracking right not the latter one yeah i think the error theorist yeah. would say that like, certain chess moves are uh correct certain chess moves are incorrect uh but, certain beliefs are correct certain beliefs are incorrect but that's like just a matter of conforming to certain standards or something but it's not but if that's a reason to do or but, believe something but if that's the case then you could believe in uh, norm like error theory about normativity, you just would never have any reasons why to believe in it. There would just not be any motivating reasons to believe in it. Well, the the, wor the worry I think is supposed to be that um, so some people think that it's it's like part of the concept of a belief that you believe something only if you think there's at least some reason to believe it. So if if the error theory says of itself that there's no reason to believe it. That you you couldn't you could get into a state that represents the error theory, but you can never get into a state of belief without being like irrational. Because if you got into a state of belief, well, I, sorry, I, I should say something even stronger. You could just never get into a state of belief with respect to the error theory, because the error theory would say. In believing it, you would believe that you have no reason to believe it, but it's a conceptual requirement on having a belief that you think there's at least some reason to believe it. So whatever state you would be in, it wouldn't be in a, it wouldn't be a state of belief. I don't know what that may, means. Yeah, I don't see how this wouldn't apply to all other beliefs, if it applies to that belief. Well, like what, what would, property is true of, you know, the proposition uh that expresses uh, right. error like normative error theory that is not true for any other well, well, let's say that it's raining outside for example there there are two different claims one claim is 
um, it's a conceptual requirement on having a belief that you believe something only if there is at least some reason to believe it. All right. But then there's a view, which is it's a conceptual requirement on having a belief that you believe something only if you believe that there's at least some reason to believe it. So the, the point is the second could be true, even if error theory is true, right? Because you might incorrectly believe that you have reasons to believe things even when you don't. So I could, so the first one is you can only believe X if there's some reason to believe X. And the second one is you can only believe X if you believe that there are reasons to believe X, right? Right. And you can have the second type of belief, but you could never have the first type of belief. You, you could have the second belief, even if error theory is look, true. Even if error theory is true, you could believe that it's raining outside. You could believe that two plus two equals four and so on on the second view, because you would believe that you have reasons to have to believe, but right. you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe two plus two equals four. You would believe that you have reasons to believe that two plus two equals four. Well, you could believe both, right? Look, look, the point is it's a conceptual requirement according to the one view on believing that two plus two equals four, um, that you believe that you have at least some reason to believe that. You couldn't have the belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4 on that view um, if you believe the error theory. If yeah, believe- that's, what, um, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying let's, let's, say that, that, let's say that error theory, let's say that that error theory is true. Um, if, if, you, if you believe that that error theory is true, then in that case, you couldn't believe anything else. That, that's what I'm asking. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that's why, like, Strumer says, psychologically impossible to believe it. Yeah, sure, sure. We can say it's, like, psychologically impossible to believe it, right? But I'm just saying that if it was the case, right, if it was the case that you affirmed such a view, which you think, which you think is probably correct, right, but because of psychological reasons, you can't affirm it, but... If you could affirm such a belief, then you couldn't believe anything else, including you couldn't believe two plus two equals four. Why? But see, look, the worry is you, because because you're making it sound like it's possible to believe the view, but having formed the belief in the view, you wouldn't be able to believe anything else. But the puzzle is that you couldn't even believe the view in the first place, because the view would say of itself, you have no reason to believe. And, it. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But like, let's say some in some possible world or something, there is this creature that is born holding one belief and one belief only, and that is that belief, right? Um, in that case, that being couldn't believe anything else. But, given- and, but, but that's, that's metaphysically impossible on that view about belief. Would it be, would it be logically impossible or physically impossible? Um, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what metaphysically impossible means. Well, it, it would be conceptually impossible, I guess, because the thought is having a belief, having a single belief is always... Oh, you mean, you mean it's in the very concept of that belief that you can't hold anyone, including itself, and so there couldn't be a creature holding that belief. Basically. The, the yeah, thought, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, see, it, I, get, I get the view yeah, now. Yeah. It's part of the concept of a belief that that if you have at least one belief then you then you have at least two no because, okay yeah i see what yeah i see because having one belief is going to entail yes, what but wouldn't that wouldn't this wouldn't this wouldn't this view if it, because you hold that the most justifiable position to hold is this view but because of psychological impossibilities we cannot hold this view right uh wouldn't that in turn entail that we're unjustified in believing all our views. Uh, say that one more time. I'm not quite sure I got it. So, um, so you 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 agree that for every belief that we hold, right? Uh, we also hold beliefs that there are reasons why we believe those first order beliefs, right? So we have these first order beliefs, like two plus two equals four, and then we have the second order belief that we have reasons to believe that two plus two equals four, right? But if error, but if normative error theory is true, there would be no such reasons, right? right. 
So, and now, and now, if you say that the most epistemically justified position is normative, sorry, I don't want to say the word most. Cancel that out. If you're saying that it is uh, normative, sorry, normative error theory is true, but because of of psychological reasons, we cannot affirm it. But given that you just affirmed that proposition. Uh, it is true, but we cannot believe it because of psychological reasons. Wouldn't that entail that all of our second-order beliefs about first-order beliefs are false? Uh, I think so, yeah. Oh, okay. If I believe that it's raining outside, I have to believe, I have at least some reason to believe that it's raining outside. But if the error theory is correct, then that uh, second-order belief is incorrect because there's no yeah. reason. But this will be for all our second order beliefs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And now apply this to Jack's view, right? Um, because I think Jack holds the view that in order to be an agent, you would have to hold second order beliefs, and those would have to be true. Wouldn't this sort of be an argument against that view in turn? I don't. I don't really know enough about Jack's. Uh, I know. Um, I mean, that just seems like an interesting way to go about using this argument. I don't know. Anyways, yeah, I get I get the argument now. I, I should mention I don't I'm not like convinced by this Olson style argument, but um but it seemed well, hold on, let me start over. There's there's the Olson style argument and then there's like the Strumer view about belief. And I'm not convinced by either of them. But both but both of them seem like the best attempts that I've seen. To uh, like work out error theory. No, you're not convinced about their attack on morality or on normativity as uh, a whole. Both, or, or I, I, I am convinced by this. I think, which is that if there's a problem for morality, then it, it's really a problem for normativity across the board. So you, or, or at so least normativity. Like companions in guilt type of a thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think Companions and Guild is really an argument against error theory, though. No, but no, I'm not saying the Companions of the Guild argument, but I'm saying this is kind of heading that way, that if this is going to be a problem for... Denying... Yeah, he's just denying normativity across the board, though, so it's not even categorical normativity. So let, let's put it this way. I, I agree. I think I agree with the Companions and Guild arguments, which is that if there's a problem with morality, then there's a problem with normativity of a certain sort across the board. But what I'm not convinced of is that it would be like manifestly absurd to just think that there's a problem with normativity across the board. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I get that. I get yeah. that part. Yeah. What one Can I ask something? Is another philosopher's modus tollens. So, I, I mean, I might not be totally following here, but I get the idea that, like, the problem is with this counts in favor relation. It seems queer. It seems like there's, you know, other views that don't involve it that can do the same work. So why have it? And then if we throw that out and we're rid of reasons, then we don't have anything requiring reasons anymore. And if all beliefs require reasons, then we don't have beliefs anymore. But... I mean, assuming that that I captured all that correctly, it, like, is I don't understand why someone wouldn't just say that beliefs are just attitudes that things are true or false and uh, don't require reasons. No, you can't have that, Isaac. He just said that you can't. He just said that your beliefs. He said that your second order beliefs are going to be false, but you can still have those first order beliefs. Sorry, just wait. Be... You uh, lost you with the terminology. A second order belief. So you, you mean a belief so, about a belief? Yeah. So your first order belief, right? Let's just say two plus two equals four, uh, is true. You can still have that belief, but you, but the belief that you have a reason why you uh, you have a reason for believing two plus two equals four is going to be false sorry if just to be clear venus second order belief in belief uh, about take, belief. wait yeah but why does belief about belief require reason no because the second order belief the, the the content of the second order belief is that your first order belief you have a reason for your first order belief wait sorry but why can't i don't i don't know that maybe i'm missing something why can't I just give the same, like, so I just objected to this by saying 
okay, let's just grant like all of this goes through, we throw out reasons and we, we say that there's some construal of belief that requires reasons and we throw out that construal and then I just give a new construal and I just say a belief is just an attitude that a proposition is true or false. And then mm -hmm. you say, okay, you can have that, but then you can't have second order beliefs. So no, beliefs you about. Can't, can, no, well, no, Vegas, you can't I'm so close to finishing. I just want to ask you something. Okay, what, sorry. Because I'm probably misunderstanding you and you'll just be able to clear it up. But then if the idea is you can't have second order beliefs, why can't I just object in the same way again to that and just say that the second order belief is also just an attitude that some proposition, namely like that I have belief X, is true, right? It doesn't need to have a reason. Why can't I just offer that construal with second order beliefs too? No, because you can't have second order beliefs. The claim is not you can't have second order beliefs. The claim is that your second order beliefs are gonna be all false. All false, yeah. Wait, why would they have to be false? Oh, because their content is that your first order belief. There are reasons for your first order belief. Why does a second order belief have to involve? Why does it have to be that there are reasons for first order beliefs as opposed to just that I have a particular first order belief? Oh, no, not all your second order beliefs are going to be false, but that set of second order beliefs. Okay, that right. Yeah, just just the subset that that believe that there are reasons for yes. your first order beliefs. Yeah, okay, all right. But that is interesting because that is int because it might not seem interesting, but the reason it's interesting is because according to his view, there is a reason to think that for any belief that you hold, you're always going to hold a second order belief about it, which is that you have a reason to hold that first order belief. That is just going to be in the concept of beliefs. Okay. And so if his view is correct, then you're going to hold like, for every belief that you hold, you hold a false belief. Okay, yeah, so for every belief you hold, you hold a second order belief that is from that subgroup of second order beliefs where you think that there's a reason for the first order belief. So every belief yeah. that you have entails a false belief. But what's the right. reason to think that every first order belief uh, entails a sec entails you holding a second order? Sorry, let me say that again. Why is it that you having a first order belief entails that you have a second order belief that you have a reason for having the first order belief? Why would that be the case? Oh yeah, Zach thinks that's in the concept of belief for some for some reason, and if you hold that, then that's just gonna follow. Why? But anyway, Zach, can you? Oh, sorry. Can yeah. you? Yeah, Zach, can you just give the? Can you just go over to that part again for uh, Isaac? Sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to demolish a cockroach right now. This guy's just on the anti-cockroach offensive, so. You know, you know, one one thing about bugs. I don't, I don't know if this will be funny to anyone other than me. But a long time ago, before I was vegan, I used to slaughter bugs. Sometimes there was um, smoked a lot of weed, and there's like a torch that you have to heat up a nail to like dab on. And there was centipedes sometimes in this place that I lived, and I would just wreck them with the torch. Like I would, I would go and like, <laughs> probably like a lot of a lot of centipedes that I've killed with torches. But yeah, Zach, what's the what's the reason why why is it on your view that having first order belief X entails that you have second order belief that there is a reason for your holding first order belief X? Is he just holding on to the to have a belief is to know to have a belief? Well that no, no, that, no, that doesn't yeah. oh well, I mean, Venus, do you, I, I, if you understand can, the reasoning, go for it. I think, I think what he holds, right, is that in the concept of belief, it's built into the concept of belief that if you believe something, you, you have a reason for believing that. Yes. And so if you believe, and if so if you believe X, then, then you would also somehow, given that it's built into the concept of the belief, if I say I believe X, th that would also entail that I believe that I have a reason for believing X. And that just yeah, so it's why just is some, that, some why like... is that the KK principle? I don't understand. Because because uh, it, you're not talking about justification. You're not saying that you're only justified yeah. if you know you're justified. In this case, you're just saying that if I if you believe X, you also believe that there is a reason for why you believe okay. X. Yeah. Well, I'm I mean, when it comes to beliefs, like, it's pretty clearly the case that we don't need like a KK principle, right? You can have all sorts of beliefs that you don't know that you have. 
Can someone just um, state the KK principle? I've not heard that before. That, uh, if, if, you, know, if you know something, you know that you know it. Okay, yeah. Add, add, add infinitum, in fact. But why? This, so, so I get that it's like some. There's like an analytic kind of move that's supposed to be happening here, where it's like it's just it's baked into having a belief that you have a second order belief about that belief that you know, or that you have a reason for holding that belief. But like, why would we? take a concept of belief where that is baked in what's what's the problem with like just why would why do we think that's the case wait i think wait, it's, I believe I think it's without reason to... it's just an intuition right no i think it's just an intuition i think it's correct. i think it's i think it's wait, useful who's, for who's saying venus it's an or well, i think it's just useful for venus to clarify that this isn't like a kk principle thing it's like a very separate kind of thing like this isn't a belief about well, this isn't like if you believe something you believe that you believe it it's just there's a second kind of property to beliefs, which is that uh, if you have at like the front of your like doxastic work box, that you probably take it to be that there's some kind of reason for your belief. But I mean, yes, yeah, do you not take that to be almost itself unlikely? It seems like there can be kinds of beliefs that I just sort of have. Like, why do I need to have? You know, morality some is kind subjective. Of... Can you mute your mic? You're popping off. Like, why, why would I need to have, like, some kind of causal account for my beliefs? Like, it seems like either that's going to get us, like, some kind of, like, voluntarism or um, some kind of, like, really informal um, omniscience that just seems weird to me. It, it seems like there's a whole host of beliefs that I have, and I can't really give you an explanation for why I have them. Well, There's no justification, right? Like, you said it yourself. Wait, but... I just, I just want to understand the. Sorry, I just have this more basic question here. That seems like getting more complicated. Just why, why is it that we would think that a belief hails a second order belief that you have a reason for holding that first order belief? Why, why would we think that? I'm not sure you would have to ask Zach that, but assuming that like you could hold some belief. And just say it's some kind of a brute contingent fact that you hold that belief, right? And do you want to explain to me what a brute contingent fact is? Uh, I mean, like without going into that, <laughs> you wouldn't believe that there is a reason why you hold that belief, but nevertheless, you would hold that belief. Wait, but what the fuck is brute contingent? F I, I know what a contingent fact is, right? I, 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 oh, uh... I guess a contingent fact is just some fact that's not true in all possible worlds, but what is, what's it mean to say it's brute? The well, idea I, that it doesn't need an explanation. I, I'm, no, I'm... Not that it doesn't need an explanation, it doesn't have an explanation. Yeah, it does, sorry, yeah, it doesn't... And, well, that's what I meant. And yeah, what, what, what does... I'm, I'm now, by the way, I, I was, I, I procured or captured the cockroach, so now I'm, yeah, here. Hell yeah! Uh, dude. He, he did it in the vegan way. He's like the server is like rubbing off on him. Um, no, I, 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 do you, do you, do you, I generally prefer to capture cockroaches rather than killing them, but but it but it's purely from self interest, which is that um, it's always easier to like just throw a cockroach out the door than it is to like clean up a huge mess. Okay, well, let me ask you that. Okay, so first of all, when you said it doesn't. Uh, doesn't have an explanation that that gets into this whole thing like I've kind of looked at this before like theories of what explanation is an explanation is one of those things that like for a long time I was like oh this is, it's obvious what an explanation is and now whenever in a conversation it gets to a point where explanation gets invoked and it's actually like an important word I'm just like I don't really know even what I think explanations are but uh, Zach uh, now that you're back I'm just wondering why why is it that you think that having a belief entails a, having a second order belief that you have a reason for having that first order belief? Uh, I didn't mean to say I hold that view. I was just describing the view of Bart Strumer. Sure, um, sir. What's, I just mean, what's the reason for, like, oh, the reason? Why, I, 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 yeah. I, honestly don't, I, don't, I honestly don't know what the argument for it is. It seems very um, weird. Uh... There, there is something kind of counterintuitive about the idea. Like, so th there are these Morian paradoxes, like where you say, um, uh, it's raining outside, but I don't know that it's raining outside. And like, it sounds even weirder to say, um, 
you know, I believe that snow is white, but I have no reason whatsoever to believe that snow is white. Uh, so you might think that it's just like a highly counterintuitive idea that you can believe something without, while at the same time acknowledging that you have no reason to believe it. And maybe that's evidence that there's this like conceptual requirement. But other than that, I don't really understand what the, the argument is supposed to be. Okay. So, yeah, think, I guess. Sorry. I, I, so, so, is, so you're just saying that there's a second order belief for every first order belief. Isn't that kind of strange, though? Do you think that animals believe things? Well, he's not. He like, just said he's not taking the view. He's just describing. Yeah, argument. but even intuitively, right? We, I mean, the first thing that you'd have to consider is like animals having certain types of beliefs, which presumably they do. And I'm not sure if they're, you know, self aware. Or if at least all animals, I, I don't think if any of them actually I, might be. I, I if just, any animal is going to be self aware of them in order to have a second order belief. I don't, I don't think it's crazy to think that the animals act for reasons. Yeah, least. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that. It's crazy to think that they don't act for reasons. I, I just don't know whether when I say that they act for reasons, I also say that they're going to be aware of themselves and the reasons, and aware of the reasons that they're committing themselves to when they act, right? So it would be well, sort of... Right, right. But, but let me be more specific. It, it's not obviously crazy to me. Well, yeah... Maybe I just can... it's not it's not that some animals I could it's not that it's inconceivable that some animals couldn't have yeah, this. I, I know what you're saying. You're, you're saying. you're saying you're saying I think what you're saying is look, dogs obviously believe things. Like they believe that their bone is buried, you know, somewhere whereabouts by the tree. But dogs clearly don't believe that they have reasons to believe that their bones are buried. In such and such places. So, if that view about belief were true, then right. it would follow that dogs don't actually believe anything. But that's like implausible. Right. If only we had yeah, QWERTY yeah, science here to argue for the complexity of animal minds. Can so I ask I, QWERTY I, something, I, though? Sorry, go ahead. I, just let me say this real quick. I was going to say that it isn't obviously absurd to me to say that animals believe that they have reasons to do things, right? But yeah, as I, I, do think, I do think that that's true. I just don't know if they have second order beliefs because, well, I generally think that second order beliefs are propositional. But I, I think animals have propositional attitudes for sure. Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, Marty, do you think attitudes that, Marty, that are you just, just, are, sorry, you said yeah. something that really tripped me out, Marty. What do you not think that first order beliefs are proposition? Um, no, I do think that. Yeah, I do think. Did I say that? You, no, you just said it's that's like it sounded like you were saying it specifically of second order beliefs, and I was like, what the fuck? Do yeah, you I, was, think a no, I was. No, I just is, corrected then? myself. Yeah, I just okay. correct. I meant like a sort of reflective propositional belief that can. God, can first order beliefs be justified? Because the ones that I'm thinking about are ones that we are aware of and ones that are going to, in some sort of way, be justified in, in virtue of other types of beliefs. There, that is, that particular proposition is going to relate to other types of beliefs and its relation to other types of beliefs. So... This is a sort of example that I give, right? There seems to be a distinction to me between like the belief that um, cigarettes are good. I, I guess I can like kind of see a cigarette right in front of me, and then I'm, I have the belief that it's good, right? It sort of disposes me towards that belief instantly. And then moving from that belief, from the particular cigarette to a sort of universal notion of a cigarette to where I can form a rational relation between this particular cigarette and other things like it causes cancer or it disposes me to certain types of health risks, right? That type of rational relation of where I can pull the particular to the universal 
I'm not I'm not really sure to what degree an animal would have that capacity, right? Especially like to make sense of all those concepts like coherently, I guess. Does that does that make sense eight and a half? Is he even there? <laughs> Don't tell me he's if, not there. If anymore. he's if he's not there, if he's out, you know, on his next cockroach hunt, hey, uh, uh, I might ask one thing. Yeah, he's probably just, there. I just want to ask one thing of Marty. So wait, Marty, what, what, uh, like, what? You run the companions and guilt argument, but like this kind of view, of Zach is. Wait, what? I don't really run the companions and guilt oh, argument. I, I, I thought the well, that's C red. I thought the CIG was like a big thing for you. So you, well, I mean, you've you've given me the CIG before. Are you are you just not? Yeah. You're actually not particularly persuaded by it. I don't know. I tend to think that there's um I'm 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 somewhat persuaded by it. I don't know if I I don't know if I really care too much about Cowie's rebuttal to it because it doesn't seem like most epistemic norms. If you're are you familiar with Cowie's reply to it? I, I have a general idea, but just to, just before it goes off in that road, okay, the I'm, only I'm, reason I'm I was sympathetic to the idea that epistemic yeah. norms and moral norms have a certain type of like univocity to yeah. them. Or... Yeah, I'm, I like I'm under the impression the the rebuttal is to try to break the analogy and then say that there's like a self defeating property that the epistemic norms have or something that the, the other ones don't. But yeah, wait, but I that's... just wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. wait. That, sorry, the only reason I brought any of this up was I just wanted to understand what kind of rebuttal you would try to offer to someone who takes this kind of view like Zach is inclined towards where they just say you know just like throw it all out we don't we don't need any of this stuff um but it sounds like you're not actually that committed to the companions and guilt well I'd be I don't because I just don't know I mean I don't know how far his error theory is committed to because he seems to deny normativity altogether whereas I think like normativity is just a fundamental aspect of like the world that you know i just think like normativity is actually inherent within the world instead of just necessarily within our intentional content and things so like that what i want to understand is what argument you would offer to someone like zach in favor of that yeah but i don't but i i, I couldn't offer one because he has like this weird error theory that he espoused earlier to, to saying that all of our beliefs right are non-normative because we can like formulate some sort of like because some sort of error theory manages to both argue for a full on elimination of norms while in the same time arguing that we can believe in error theory and unless I understand that argument right then I don't know how I would reply let, to him. Let me interrupt just real quick. And and by the way, you should probably go to sleep because Yeah. I probably go to sleep so if it's true that i should go to sleep then yeah i mean but, but I mean, it's unfortunately like... for both of us it's not the case that anyone should go to sleep so but anyway um well it was uh, interesting enough to keep me awake so it is... what, what was i saying um yeah i think the term normative is probably ambiguous or at least it it's used in an, in an ambiguous way in a lot of these discussions so I, I think the normative error theorist can agree that there is normativity in the sense that um, there are correct and incorrect chess moves and that beliefs can be accurate or inaccurate or like a gas gauge can be representing something correctly or representing it incorrectly. Hmm. But but that's a sense of the term normative that is different from the sense of the term normative when the error theorist claims that there's no, no normativity. So it, it can be true that a chess move is correct or incorrect, or that a gas gauge is accurate or inaccurate, or that a belief is correct or incorrect, even if there's no reasons to do or believe anything. Um, so I think we need to like keep those things clearly distinguished. So I, I might be able to, to allow that like mental states exist and are normative in the one sense, 
while at the same time denying that they exist and are normative in the other sense. Just ca- re- repeat the other sense that you're talking about a little bit. But so one, one sense has to do with like conforming to a standard, uh-huh. correct or incorrect, accurate or incorrect, uh-huh. right, accurate or inac- inaccurate. And the other sense of normativity has to do with like one thing's being a reason to do something or counting in favor of doing something. And those I, don't, things, I, I guess I don't understand the distinction, well, that, Marty. Because generally when I, oh, hold on just a second, because generally when I'm acting in accordance with reasons, the world has certain types of rational constraints that it puts upon me that I want to endorse or, or not endorse, right? Certain types of norms with which I want to be in accordance with or not be in out of accordance with. So at one, at once, you know, the, the, there seems to be a world that seems to constrain me into making certain types of endorsements. Um, I mean, on, on, but I couldn't. I also couldn't make any sort of endorsements without already having certain sets of beliefs that I have to also uphold and be consistent it, with. I mean. It, it, it most certainly could be true that a certain chess move is incorrect, even though you have all things considered reason to make that move. So correctness and incorrectness at least comes apart from the idea of having a reason to do something um, in the sense that whether you have all things considered reason to, to do something is always going to be separate from whether something is correct or incorrect. Now, you could respond to that and say, well, even if you have all things considered reason um, to make the incorrect move, the fact that the move is incorrect is always at least some reason not to make that move. Um, but there are certain like coherent positions where it seems like, according to that position, you can say that like a belief is false um, but there's no reason whatsoever not to hold um, that belief. So like on a particularist view, you could think that there are situations in which um, you have every reason to have an incorrect belief and no reason not to have it. So the, the sense of, of normativity that is tied to correctness and incorrectness comes apart completely from the notion of normativity that is tied to what you have reason to do or what you have reason not to do. Marty, you too? Could you, you, you could say that it's like mm-hmm. analytic or, or a priori that if something is correct, then you have at least some reason to have an attitude toward it. And if something is correct, you have at least some attitude, at least some reason to have an attitude toward it. Well, it certainly seems like that that would be the case. Marty, do you, do you appreciate the distinction that he's drawing between the two senses of normativity? I I, I don't know, man. <laughs> like so, if it like to just person. to just sum it up in like really quick language, and Zach can yeah. tell me if I'm missing it, but I think it's I think I understand what he's saying. So there's a distinction between saying X corresponds with some rule versus saying. There is a consideration that counts in favor of X. That's the distinction you're talking about, right, Zach? Exactly. So, Marty, just X corresponds with some rule versus there's a consideration that counts in favor of X. So that's the distinction. And then if you want examples, an example is like moving your knight directly forward nine squares does not correspond with the rules of chess, right? That's the X does not correspond with a rule, sense of normativity. And then you have a reason not to move your knight nine squares forward. That is the other sense of normativity where uh, it's normative if you have a reason, there's a reason counting in favor or against X. So do you appreciate the difference? X is in line with the rule versus there is a reason that counts in favor of X? Generally, when we're formulating reasons for why certain things are true, it would be that they have an identity with how the world is. But but just for do you but do you appreciate the distinction there that he's talking about? Like regardless of what position you take or whether you you 
agree with one of these or the other. It's just you understand you the two are distinct. Do you, like appreciate, like do I recognize a conceptual distinction? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If that's all you mean by appreciate, sure. Yes, that's all I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, just so he's, having he's, a certain type of having yeah. having at least certain yeah certain forms of reasons that increase the probability of my belief in X versus having certain types of beliefs that would correspond necessarily to how things are. It was just right? co correspondence with a rule versus you, you have a reason in favor of, and and he just the reason <laughs> the reason that that distinction came up was he's just trying to say you can lose one and not the other, right? You and you don't you don't get some like logical contradiction. You just have one of those on your view and not the other. It's not like a problem right. with it necessarily. So when when you say stuff about like the the horrors of losing normativity or whatever, he he's given you a reply where he's saying like, well, yeah, you can lose it in that one sense, but you can still have it in this other sense. You can still have like correspondence with rules even if you say reasons don't make sense because of this queer like counts in favor of relations. So we're going to throw out reasons. Like you can still have the other yeah. sense of normativity. Which one does he which what, does would, what, what would be what would be especially problematic? I think I agree would be that if the view about normativity, that is normative error theory, um, if it entailed um, that there's like no such thing as like accurately representing something as opposed to inaccurately <laughs> representing it, because then it seems like, well, um, well... That's what I would generally hold. I mean, like when one... I mean, when one is giving a sort of, I don't know, a theory of reference for some reason, for some sort of object, right, and associating some set of, um, like, giving some sort of account for it propositionally, obviously, like, one can't just offer any sort of explanation because they would be an error, right? They'd have to give certain forms of justifications that are good or good reasons for generally corresponding certain types of propositional statements with that object. Yo, how, how can you have reasons to do something, right? Uh, you made like this distinction between two senses of normativity, but how can you have reasons to do something if not in virtue of some standard? I, I don't really... Which goes back to the first sense of normativity. I mean... It's going to depend on what you mean by a standard. Like, so, for example, in the, in the case of the rules of chess, those, in some sense, seem to be, like, invented. There are, like, certain social conventions that we can appeal to that explain the existence of the rules of chess. Certainly, you can have reasons to do something if there's no standard in that sense. Um, so, right. presumably, you would mean, mean a standard in some other sense. Uh, so like maybe what you mean is something like how could you have reason to do something if if there's no principle linking the descriptive features of something with um, the counting in favor of relation that holds when those descriptive features are met or something. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, I mean, that's just what particularists say, right? They'll, they'll say that they're that, I mean, one way of interpreting particularism is that when you have a reason to do something, there's just no explanation for why that's so. There's, there's nothing in virtue of which that relation holds. Yeah, I don't understand. So it's, it seems like it seems like once you analyze this, like all you'll be left with is some kind of particularism if you give up the first notion. And I'm not sure what it means. Like I, I understand that, I understand that there isn't supposed to be, a re like, you su you're supposed to have a reason to do something, but not in virtue of some prince, some universal principle or anything like that. I just I'm not, I'm not sure what that would even mean though. But I understand that's the particularist view. But it seems like that's the view you would be left with if you give if you well, give up the first I mean, form of normativity. I mean, first of all, I, I I'm sympathetic to particularism, but second of all. I still think there's a difference between it being the case that um, there's something in virtue of which you have a reason to do something, and, and maybe that in virtue of which you have a reason to do something is like a principle or whatever. 
um, there's a difference between that and like there being a rule that you conform with. Um, I, I would have to think about more about what that difference is. Yeah, well, well, yeah I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not making a distinction between a rule, principle, standard, or whatever. I'm using all of those interchangeably. There just seems to be something, some kind of standard, like, what fall under one of those. Unless, like, you're some kind of a particularist, why you would have a reason to do one thing over another, or any, or do any, or have reason to do anything. But it seems like if you give if you give up the first view, uh, all you'll be left with is some kind of particularism. If I'm tracking what you've been saying correctly. I, I, yeah, I think a lot of this can be sidestepped by like, it's very tempting to put it in terms of whether or not. You guys have a good night. I got a I got a code of it. So no problem. It was nice talking. I'll talk. Bye, to you Marty. Later. Bye.